Um, I welcome everybody who's joined in today to this webinar on uh, the evolution of digital talent, implications for talent development. Um, I'm speaking to you from Bangalore in India and uh, wherever you are, whichever uh, part of the world that you're logging in from, a very warm welcome to you once again. Um, today we have a very special guest uh, joining us. Um, we have Dr. Swati Sarangi, uh, who leads capability development at uh, Lassen and Tupro, um, joining us today. And I'm very excited to have her uh, in our webinar. Um, me, I work with Northscape. I'm a senior director and I need the Northscape uh, Insight Center. So that's a quick introduction uh, from my end. Um, so we are going to get started now. Um, and I'm going to take the first few minutes to um, introduce our speaker. Uh, and I'm very, uh, like I said, I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Swati Sarangi join us today. Um, here's a little bit about her uh, before we get started. Um, so her formative years were uh, spent in the temple city of uh, Bhubaneswar, Odisha in India. And um, she made a switch over to corporate life after a distinguished stint of nearly two decades in academia. Um, she has extensive experience in teaching leadership training, research, and consultancy uh, across different areas of HR. Um, she is extremely high on learning agility and curiosity um, and uh, has a lot of passion in the application of human constructs uh, at the workplace to achieve enhanced people advantage. Uh, she is a champion for diversity initiatives and speaks and writes um, in areas such as culture, organizational development, change, learning, and leadership. Um, so once again, welcome, uh, Dr. Swati. It's a pleasure to have you, um, and we look forward to um, having you uh, speak at this webinar. So um, with that, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to get started uh, with the topic uh, for today. Um, I will take the first uh, about 10 odd minutes to set the context and uh, introduce the subject in hand, which is the evolution of digital talent and what it means really for uh, talent management and talent development. Uh, once uh, I do that, I will then hand over the reins to Dr. Swati Sarangi, uh, who will in turn uh, talk about her perspective and her experiences of having um, work, worked extensively in the talent development arena and how she views this shift um, from a capability development standpoint. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, then get started. Um, so uh, here are a, you know, a few trivia questions for uh, the audience that's joined here. Um, so here's a question, right? So what did ANZ Bank do to become really flexible? Uh, and you don't have to you know, type in your responses or anything. This is just a reflection question. If you know the answer, then that's great. Um, so what did they do to become more flexible in responding to technology-based drivers? Um, so what ANZ Bank in Australia has interestingly done is that they have broken down their internal uh, hierarchies and bureaucracies and silos and said that we will now function as 150 teams that will look more like startups than traditional uh, parts of a large bank. Right? Here's the second question. Which organization has built an AI platform called Marcel uh, in collaboration with Microsoft in order to connect about 80,000 odd employees all over the world um, to provide more seamless communication, collaboration, and so on and so forth. So what this company is essentially doing is that it's, it's leveraging technology to improve their culture, um, which I thought was very innovative. So the answer is uh, Publicis Group, which is the French uh, advertising and media agency um, named after their founder. Um, you know, this, this software or this AI powered innovation will help in transforming the organization from a holding company to a platform is, is how they um, view it, right? Uh, and which is the company that is so obsessed with customer delight that it clocked the longest ever customer service uh, call ever at uh, 10 hours and 43 minutes. Uh, some of you might know this. Um, so this is, uh, you know, uh, this is probably uh, assuming that you know the answer to this. Uh, this is Zappos, right? Um, and you see here the employee who was uh, uh, who was responsible. Uh, for uh, for this uh, you know uh, for this for this amazing achievement right which is 10 hours of um, clocking one single customer voice call right um, so you know that's just a little bit of warm up for us for us to understand the world that we live in in the digital age that we're in um, and here is here is the crux of what we're trying to discuss today which is the evolution of digital talent and its implication for the modern workplace. So the workplace, as we all know, is shifting, right? So we are in the middle of this um, groundbreaking shift, as we call it. And everywhere you go, people talk about the future of work and future of workplace. 
So let's quickly spend a minute to understand what it was like and what it is transforming to today, right? Um, so this is adapted from the future organization. Uh, we used to be, again, very used to, uh, you know, a lot of rigidity when it comes to the way that we work, um, which is shift timings, fixed working hours, and so on and so forth. That is, of course, changing, and we know that there is a lot of flexibility available, um, at least in some workplaces. Uh, so that's one. Uh, there used to be a lot of focus on compliance. Now uh, the focus is uh, slowly but surely moving towards productivity. So how do I ensure that my people have the right set of tools to work uh, more effectively? Uh, there used to be set defined career paths in the way that people used to move within an organization. Uh, today, there is a lot of focus on uh, shaping your own career, right? So uh, how will you shape your own career as, as, uh, as someone who works in the new corporate world, right? Um, Sharing was anathema, right? So there was a lot of focus on hierarchy, silos. Uh, that's breaking down. We see that sharing is caring. We are focusing on connections. We are helping people work with each other. Right? So that's that's under focus. And the premium was on know-how. So if you knew things, um, you were you know held in high regard. Um, today, the premium is on learning agility. So it's it's important to know, but it was also important to unlearn and relearn. Uh, so that's how the corporate workplace and you know the talent is shaping up. So what does it mean for talent management and talent development professionals um, is the question that we are after. Right? So what are the implications? And this is the crux of it. So I'm going to open with this, which is that, uh, you know, we used to plan for linear work, which is, uh, you know, straight line work in terms of what everybody is expected to do. With flexible work, we're planning for agile work, right? So um, employees are taught how to learn in an agile manner. And this is, of course, borrowed from the software world, right? So how do you bring in agility in the way that you work? Okay. Um, because there was compliance, there was, uh, you know, a lot of direction that was given and risk taking was usually discouraged. Um, today you have a lot of autonomy and uh, people do encourage a fail fast kind of an environment. Um, we used to invest a lot in structured career development, right? So what do you do uh, throughout your uh, career from point A to point B to point C and so on. With you shaping your career now, with you being more empowered, uh, there are a lot of flexible career options developing, right? So we see uh, people, um, you know, getting their feet wet in all different kinds of areas. Um, command and control leadership, predefined workflow, right? So um, these, this is what we were used to. Today, collaborative leadership and fluid ways of working is being uh, advocated. Um, and it was tough to shake up that fixed mindset because it is all about a few people knowing a lot of things. Um, now, proactively, people are encouraged to have a growth mindset, which is that nothing is really fixed. So the more you learn, the better you can grow as an individual professional and therefore also in your career. So these are some of the you know, basic implications for talent development um, professionals. However, where do we stand today? So what does the research show? What does the data show in terms of readiness of organizations when it comes to being ready for um, this new era? Right. So this is from, uh, from a report uh, of Capgemini and LinkedIn, which says that about, uh, you know, there's a gap. So I'm going to quickly take you through this. Um, which is that you see there's a gap, 54% uh, in, uh, you know, organizations losing competitive advantage because of a shortage of digital talent. 59% uh, of employers say that, um, you know, the organization lacks employees who possess soft digital skills. And we will come to this in a minute. Um, and uh, employees themselves feel that their skill set is redundant or will be in the next few years. So uh, here is the bottom line. The talent gap is widening. Uh, the talent gap in soft skills is, is more pronounced right, than in hard digital skills, um, and employees are anxious. Um, here are some more figures for you. So 60% of uh, talent feel that uh, you know, they're okay with investing their own time and money to be on par with uh, colleagues on those skills. 55% um, uh, of, of them feel that um, you know, they are willing to move on to another organization if they are not able to upskill themselves in the current uh, workplace. And 58% uh, are likely to gravitate towards organizations that offer better digital skill development. So uh, what this means again is that employees want to excel, right? They're, they're looking to go beyond what their organizations are giving them. But there is a skill redundancy fear and the lack of faith in upskilling efforts, um, which could in turn trigger attrition. So this is the stark reality that we face um, as talent professionals, right? So this is the context uh, in terms of what, uh, you know, where the workplace is and where talent development is and where the gaps are. Um, and these are some of the reasons as to why, uh, you know, there is, there is a lack of focus when it comes to building some of these soft digital skills that I spoke about. Um, and what you see here are some of the many reasons uh, as to why 
uh, you know, they might not be um, friendly. Or friendly. These are also some of the reasons that um, they are more essential, right? So take, for example, inward focus. Uh, if you are too inwardly focused as an organization, you might not know what's happening outside. Um, or learning agility as another example. Right? So these, these are all reasons why you have, uh, you know, soft digital skills being essential today. Um, and what do these uh, skills look like really, which is the next question. And here are some of the, uh, you know, skills again from the same report that I referenced earlier. Um, uh, a lot of these would be familiar uh, to you. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to leave it there for a second for you to grasp it, right? So there's a gap between what organizations need and the proficiency of their employees uh, in almost all of these uh, soft digital skills what the, the research says, but boiling the ocean is not going to cut it, right? Especially, uh, and I'm sure we all know this because we're all talent professionals, uh, especially when it comes to behavioral skills. So what we need is a defined talent strategy that meets both business objectives and the needs of um, digital talent in order to sustain and also thrive um, in this digital age, right? So uh, this is the context, this is where we are. Uh, and as promised, I took, uh, I think just about 10 minutes to be able to um, you know, share this with you. And what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to um, request uh, Swati to come over and share with her uh, her experiences of um, how she views this uh, this entire transformation happening from her. So I'm going to do a. I'm going to stop my screen share, with Swati, so that you can uh, in turn share your screen and take over. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Swati. Yeah. Subhu, can you hear me? I mean, I think everybody is there. Probably I'll just continue from here. Yes, please so do. Really, loud and clear. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So it's really nice to uh, hear your insights. And I think you've set the context uh, very well. So in terms of uh, what's changing and uh, what kind of impact uh, it has uh, for talent development. Now, if we look at the changing landscapes, and Subhu did talk about in terms of what we see in terms of the workplace and in terms of talent. So if you clearly see the digital workplace is buzzed with words like, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the IoT, uh, augmented and virtual reality, and so many of these doing the rounds. And uh, these are important because they help us uh, organizations become more effective and more competitive. Now, if you're talking about what kind of talent we need uh, to be, uh, you know, functioning in this kind of a scenario, we are uh, witnessing some of these themes. We are seeing millennials. We are also having things like work from anywhere, the gig economy, which is, uh, you know, famous, talked about. And uh, then again, you also have people who are shouting out and saying that, uh, hey, I also want to work, but I want to have my me time. And uh, there is also a focus on uh, flexibility along with uh, being tech savvy. So which means there's a lot of lot changing at work and there's a lot of change in, changes happening on the talent front in terms of how they want to align with the changes in the work. And that's also got to do with the socialization and the ecosystem that's happening not just at work, but also in the way people are uh, brought up and what they see and what they experience. To take it forward, uh, talking about its impact on the corporate world, I think uh, what we are witnessing is a kind of technology disrupting the corporate world. Like, uh, for example, the new forms of businesses which have come about, and those businesses, the erstwhile ones, the successful giants, which have been wiped out because they were not able to cope up with the onslaught of technology. That uh, we, we, we witnessed is several uh, success stories of business houses like Nokia, and then we had Kodak and a few others who've just not been there and not been there because they just did, uh, did not, uh, you know, abreast technology in the pace that they uh, could have or should have. And also we're witnessing new kind of business models uh, providing competition to the erstwhile ones. So everything is changing and is being disrupted. The average lifespan of S&P companies, if we look at it, that has also shrunk in size. So which means that the sustainability factor for companies has become really, really questionable. So survival of the fittest and how to survive it's, itself has become a question. 
I think Subhu also uh, threw some light about these aspects. If we look at the various uh, dimensions of the digital workplace, if we had to look at it, primarily, you know, this is uh, we can uh, this is the Deloitte report, and we can club them in three areas, three dimensions: the work, the workforce, and the workplace. The work has changed, and there's no doubt about it. Whatever work was being done earlier, this will be what work is being done now. If we look at it, the whole range of work also has undergone a change so many so many jobs have become redundant so many new jobs have got created merged so the whole concept of automation taking over ai taking over and only in the next few years we can say that everything is going to get rescripted talking about workplace workplace also has become very dynamic because you know with new models coming in we have uh, you know the comp the way the employees are there the way they're aligned to customers the way they're embracing the new models everything is undergoing a change in the workforce uh, now um, in the workplace and therefore it has implications on the workforce now the workforce when we talk about it let's align these three categories so we have the automation level, we have the physical proximity level because virtual connectivity is there. You might be working with teams who are not physically present in a particular place, but they're still connected. So how do we get to configure and align the various dimensions of work, workforce, and workplace in order to be able to come, uh, come at a relationship which is effective, symbiotic, and sustainable? Okay, talking about uh, how the changes has evolved over a period of time, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But if we just try to sort of reflect on the changes, we will see that from 1990s to what it is now, there have been a whole continuum of you know, focus on automation to then moving on to integration, engagement, and today it's performance, so perform. And if you look at the spectrum on talent, you will see that, you know, it has an implication thereof. So, you know, when we were trying to automate in the 1990s, you were focusing on getting all your SAP and, you know, your different kinds of systems in place. Then you went on to integrate. So you had a lot of integration portals coming in. And then with all the engagement fundas doing the round, we had the engagement surveys and cultural analytics. And uh, data showing up and saying, okay, now what do we do with this? And today there is a lot of focus on teams. And we are, again, you know, we have to deliver. So performance, productivity, and uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, so business performance in terms of parameters like um, what kind of profits you are making, whether you're, uh, you know, penetrating into new geographies, whether you're embracing digital, whether, um, uh, whether or not you are uh, trying to, you know, make the work clock ticking and whether you're able to be more network, whether you're team oriented, all of this is there. Now, in this entire range, if you see the whole range of talent management has also undergone a change from being, you know, focused on processes and systems to then focusing on culture and engagement and today focusing on network of teams. So it's not just one team, it's a network of teams. You find networks of teams where? You find them in the organization, you find collaborating with people, and Subhu talked about it, collaboration. Uh, you know, it's an open system. So you're collaborating with people outside the organization, maybe internal customers, external customers. So everything is uh, connected that way. So the flow has become very, very important and very incessant. Okay, so when we talked about what is digital, we talked about what kind of implications it has for talent management, we have to talk about change. Why? Because uh, in this entire uh, range of what's happening in the environment, what gets addressed uh, most is the concept of change management. We have to prepare leaders for change, for dealing with change. So therefore, you know, these elements become very cardinal. Are we making them aware? Are we making them agile, adaptive, and also aligned? And even if you go back and look at this question for talent management professionals, somewhere down the line, and I would say all HR professionals need to be focusing on all of these A's. You know, to what extent they're aligned with corporate strategy and the environment? To what extent they're adaptable with the changes happening? Are they agile to predict, you know, uh, what will happen next? 
and are they aware of the business context so these are important uh, imperatives not just for the talent but also for talent management and these are very cardinal to change so but anything that's happening in the space of talent has to keep aware of all these days in my view if you look at uh, how change has happened and in the space of talent and talent management we can look at it very beautifully in the form of you know earlier how it was more like people some there would be people who would resist change and they could afford to resist change then you know people started controlling change okay in some pockets we do it and some pockets we don't and now it's more about embracing change and embracing change full on more proactively there is no question of saying whether it's an option it is happening you have to take it and how well you take it and how you well you lead with it is what is going to make um, you know the organizations effective and talent management also effective so which means that the change continuum if you see also it has gone you know really stretched from resistance to control to embracing and why i'm saying this i'm saying this because as talent management professionals and also as people who are responsible for building talent we have to keep in mind that we ourselves need to change and change really really fast little bit about the imperatives and i think uh, subhu also delved uh, on this so i won't uh, go deeper into it well the hard digital skills are there if you can see on the right hand side all these uh, digital skills when you are preparing the talent uh, workforce for the di digital world the digital workforce so to say the hard skills are all there and very demanding they have to be there so uh, these are more like in the area of analytics data you know innovation your design thinking so you are trying to find out solution oriented approaches um and all that is making a lot of revolutions happening and strides happening in this field if you look at the left hand side column those are also equally important because while we are focusing on riding high using the hard skills we cannot ignore the softer aspects or the human side of it, talent those are very important they say if you have to compete with the bots you have to be more human so in order to make the employees or i would say talent more human you know these aspects the softer aspects are also important so we have collaboration we have dexterity so you want an employee who can um, manage several things and the ambiguity so we have the vuka world today and uh, we want him to be very customer centric because you want to bridge the gap between him and his uh, customers you want to want him to empathize very well with them because he should not seem like uh, you know just doing his work but he should be more like wanting to deliver a promise so these aspects also become very very important learning agility another term that you know we at lmt also give a lot of emphasis on we want people to be lifelong learners and how fast they can learn can they really uh, uh, sort of um, forecast well predict well learn on their feet learn on the fly and again when they are taking decisions can they use their wisdom and insight to combine and make sense of the data that they have do so you have a lot of data points you know thanks to technology you have uh, quantitative data you have qualitative data so can you call out and draw insights which are really really meaningful there's one more term there which is the entrepreneurial mindset like he talked about the growth mindset which means looking at possibilities here you're looking at ownership anybody of uh, you know in the organization is a leader in his own right can he make things happen can he be an entrepreneur of his life of his role and his organization now when we are trying to close the skill gap building talent so here here is a way to go probably when we are looking at this you know when we are trying to build this talent intelligence we are trying to have skills uh, which are uh, you know easy to uh, scale we're also trying to have a uh, cater to those skills which are in demand but what are we exactly trying to do it is threefold we are trying to build we're trying to acquire and we're trying to grow so uh, 
typically if you see all your hr functions can be also put in these three buckets you try to do acquisition you try to acquire talent you try once you get the talent then you focus on building them honing their skills and competencies and of course uh, keep them on a learning mode and when they when you're building competencies you also want them to grow here the grow part is also linked to engagement and retention so that they are growing with you and uh, the energies are fused and you're building an organization that is why the build grow and acquire in these three areas also when digital is happening when talent uh, is being impacted then our role will also get impacted in these three areas where our competencies and the way we approach talent the way we approach our role in these three areas will also change the lens has to change now some insights that i'd like to share especially from an lnd standpoint i thought it will be a good idea uh, we are a large organization as all of you would know and 80 years old we are a huge conglomerate we have several and part of the group that is a corporate hr we have several uh, businesses who are part of the group now a lot has changed in lnd from the way it started to what it is now some things have remained same some things in the sense the culture the values because this was started uh, as an organization by two foreign uh, you know uh, foreign citizens so to say we had uh, larson and uh, hawk larson and soren tobro who started this organization and then we have had lot of stalwarts leading the organization and then taking it on from there to here it has been a story of growth how has all this happened what made this happen lnt is not uh, has never had an owner it has had uh, owners in every employee so we have had to nurture talent now when we use the word talent we use it very responsibly it's important that we siphon and say all employees are important but maybe not all of them are really leaders in the making and our talent so we focus on identifying the top talent who are high potential and high performers notwithstanding we also give lot of importance to solid citizens who are there and employees who are pillars of the organization but we definitely do a screening and have a robust assessment process which is your development center approach now once we have screened and scan scanned and got the best cream of our organization who are high potential leaders we try to groom them at every stage so that they are transitioning from wherever they are to take on new responsibilities and take lnt ahead in their career and they grow and lnt also grows alongside them so there is a comprehensive talent development process it's a very systematic process where uh, business invests hr executes and uh, you know the performers thrive this is the comprehensive seven step leadership pipeline process at lnt it's very well known and um, if you see you know we actually start very early from about 7 to 10 years of experience when these engineers we primarily have engineering leaders because they join us as engineers gts from the leading campuses of uh, india now once they uh, join us and then we have what is called a mep mep is management education program so for those engineers who have not done their mbas and aspire to get a mba from a leading b school we partner with uh, im amdabad and offer what is called a equivalent to a pgpx program and then uh, we after there that we have the step 2 step 2 is you know with about 10 years of experience which is the ldp program and uh, that is again a 9 months journey in all uh, our leadership programs there are actually journeys i am saying journeys and not programs because or uh, they do an actual learning project they have a coaching they have mentoring so it's a whole lot of things put together so that uh, and also a lot of focus on the role which means that we're not looking simply at a, as a stand alone training program and the leader in question actually goes through all these pipeline steps and you know uh, he uh, moves through all these steps and he transitions so you know we partner with the leading global schools so i would not uh, get into details but we have ross michigan insead harvard uh, you know they are our partners and we also send uh, some of our very senior executives to attend the advanced management programs of the likes of the leading b schools like uh, you know so many of them are there like uh, lbs is there insead again oxford so many of them 
And then, of course, what's very unique is we also have a mentoring, which is done by our group executive chairman and other leaders. So all in all, if you look at it, there is a lot of investment, dedicated time and effort put in by our leaders to invest, uh, uh, you know, the future leaders. And we, uh, we as a part of talent development, do that, uh, uh, endeavor to do that well. Now, dimensions of talent development. When we are focusing on talent development, the word holistic is important for us. We, we feel that it's not only about skill sets. It's a lot about mindsets. And we look at developing the person as a whole. So we focus on self, we focus on leading others, leading business, and leading change. These are the uh, elements that we focus on when we are building talent. So for example, for leading self, we are focusing on mindfulness. Can he, uh, can he build resilience? Can he sort of uh, you know, uh, deal with his own setbacks? Can he also have a vision for himself? When we are looking at leading others, we are focusing on tenets like social intelligence, inspiring results. Leading business, we, have, we focus on strategic thinking. Uh, you know, we focus on um, building sustainable growth for business. And again, change. Change, uh, we use various change models also to drive all of that. So all these amalgamated together is about uh, talent development here. Okay, now talking about the LNT example, and again, I'd like to go back to the talent space. I think uh, in most organizations in India and globally, when we look at talent development, it is leadership in the forefront because ultimately talent is all about leaders. Now, when we are talking about leaders, today the digital leaders, the connotation of digital leaders has these few elements according to me. One is, of course, uh, in, able to inspire results because it's very competitive. You have to get your team to work there and see value in what they are trying to achieve. Second is collective leadership. This is similar to collaborative, but it's a little different in the sense is Power is not bestowed on one person. It's more shared. So therefore, it is collective. Probably somewhere you're a team player, somewhere you're a team lead. The concept of power is more shared today. And then mindset, digital mindset. So digital mindset means that every leader need not be a digitally, uh, digitally proficient leader in the sense that he can only use certain skill sets which are digital. But can he identify those cases which are which can be digitized in his business? Does he have a mindset which is more digital oriented? Can he think digitally? And millennial leaders, I'm not uh, going to hype the millennials, but I would say that no matter what the age group today, even if we are in an older generation, our thinking has become a lot millennial-like. So therefore, you know, you see the millennial leaders, I'm not only talking about those who are born millennials in terms of chronological age. And if you see the last one there, uh, leaders today have to be inward, outward, and forward-looking. Inward-looking because they have to connect with self, outward because with others, and forward because they need to have the vision and the foresight. With so much of change happening and so much of rapid strides, can they really be forward-looking? Because uh, they have to think ahead of the times. Well, some key implications for talent management there, and uh, these are very, very important for us, is that... Um, we have to move with the speed of change. Whatever we are crafting and doing things in terms of developing talent, nurturing talent, whether it's models, whether it's practices, whether it's um, you know, uh, shared implications, we have to make it really fast. Second is illusion of value. This I think is interesting because uh, you know what happens many times, we think we've done a great job, but have we really added value? Do the business leaders or the business See us as adding value in terms of providing people and solutions who can help business in the real sense of the term. And third is getting outside of the bubble. Many times, you know, it's all about fashions and fads. We pick up a few terms here and there, which are doing the rounds. And we think it's good enough to do be just able to do that because we want to ape what companies uh, alongside, uh, you know, in the context are doing. But it's more about getting outside the bubble and trying to think uh, beyond. And the last one is, of course, building strategic partnerships. Here, uh, I think strategic partnerships is a lot about uh, forging alliances with consultants, with experts outside of your organization. That means 
the industry consultants who can provide because you can't have expertise to pro, to be able to do everything and deliver so if you want quality if you want effectiveness you need to identify partners you can align with it could be partners uh, in the form of consultants in the form of academicians it could be even your internal partners for example uh, you are in the uh, talent management you could uh, align with somebody in your digital team or an analytical team we in at lnt we work in a very collaborative way with uh, many of the other teams and we've derived uh, immense value so all this has come from strategic uh, partnership building and as uh, i'd like to conclude i would say that uh, we talked about digital space we talked about digital workplace workforce and digital talent digital leaders and its implications for talent development but if you have to look at what are the changing paradigms in talent management and i would like to summarize by saying that from a very siloed approach where talent management was one piece of hr today talent management has to align with everything within hr and with business so therefore from being siloed and being networked the vertical and the horizontal fitment the vertical with corporate strategy and the horizontal with other subsystems of hr has to be there so whether it's you know other elements of hr and not just uh, being restricted or confined to talent second is one cannot afford to be rigid the same applies for talent management we did something so the past is not something the trends in the past can only be okay from a learning standpoint yes but we have to look at flexibility uh, changes that are happening and we cannot say that this is the way we did this is the way so you have to get things done and therefore we have to be very flexible in our own approaches and style this is again piecemeal and holistic i talked about it when i was talking about the dimensions so targeting one and finding looking at it as the panacea or uh, the way to do things will not work it has to be more holistic in terms of when you're looking at a person in the from the talent standpoint or looking at a function from within an organization from a talent management perspective again both ways it has to be very systemic very holistic a uh, gone are the days where one size fits all work same applies for talent you have talent who are coming to join you they're demanding they have aspirations which are different they've come here to build and sculpt careers and we have a responsibility to provide meaning to them and also ensure that in doing so we are helping them add value to the organizational growth story so from standardized ways of managing talent we have to look at customized ways maybe somebody needs more flexibility maybe somebody values more respect maybe uh, you know so what are the needs and how to what extent we can target them and in doing all of this definitely a makeover has to happen in the way we approach issues the way we find solutions the way we break our assumptions and move beyond so from conventional to being very innovative is the way to go and when i say innovative it's a big word so adopting design thinking adopting ai uh, joining hands with uh, technology and learning from uh, different uh, tools different uh, available resources that uh, digital has made us available we have to look at innovative solutioning and uh, with this i think i have shared uh, my perspectives and i'm open to take questions i hope uh, we had some good uh, insights uh, you know shared great thanks a lot uh, dr swati that was uh, great uh, thanks for sharing your insights um what i will um, you know ask the audience that's listening in is in case you have any questions for dr swati or me please uh, type them out um, either in the q and a section on your screen or uh, in the chat section right so one of the two boxes you can use uh, and as and when they come in i will post them to um, dr swati Yes, so there's a question on. Am I going to share the PPT? We are recording this video, so we'll share the link to the video once it's done. Uh, let me see if we can share a few um, slides as well. That was from Kapilesh. 
Um, question from Aman Kumar is uh, how to efficiently use digital for learning sustenance? Um, any thoughts there, Dr. Swat? Yeah. So for learning, uh, learning sustenance, or for learning to be sustainable, or for learning sustenance, what is what is it? What is the question? I think that's what he means, which is that how do you ensure that there is, uh, you know, uh, over time yeah. people gain whatever it is that they're learning. Right, right. So you know what we have done is we have we often use uh, reinforcement technologies. Now reinforcement uh, technologies are uh, like you know trying to ensure that there is this Velcro effect. You know what's a Velcro? No, Velcro is when learning sticks. So how do you make learning stick? One is you make the learning piece very interesting. The more in, the interesting they find them, the more engaged they are, the more fun and value they're going to derive from it. That's number one. So make the learning experience absolutely interesting. Second part of is after the learning has happened, make it, uh, you know, make it uh, stay with them. How do you make it stay? Make them apply, reward them for the application. I'm not saying every time you go and reward them, but you know, make it uh, sound like a rewarding experience. And also uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, try to make action learning projects. We can give them some kind of, uh, make them parts of task forces where they can uh, get a chance to apply. So the whole idea is there should not be a disconnect between what they learn and what they do at work. If that becomes fused and if that becomes enjoyable, it definitely sticks and becomes sustainable. That is my experience. Great, thanks, uh, Dr. Swati. Yeah. And if I may add, I think to what Dr. Swati was saying, which is that first of all, just to summarize, what she said is that first you need to make the learning stick, right? It has to be interesting for the learner. Then the application, yeah. various ways through ALPs, etc., also help. Um, and to your point, Aman, I think on digital is that you can also use platform, which is what we do as an organization at Northscape, uh, which is that you have a, a you know self-paced learning platform available for your employees to access learning anywhere. So if they want to probably take a refresher, yeah. uh, you know, they can probably log into that and do that. Yeah, so I just want to build on on this point to Aman's question. We can also make uh, people more curious, you know, make them curious so that they want to learn, that, th that hunger, that thirst for knowledge should be there. And second, uh, as you said, uh, because of digital, uh, we also have various resources and aids available. So the app-based learning, the mobile-based learning, learning on the go, all that has become easier, no? Because of technology. So that only helps. Sure, sure, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Swati. We have a uh, few more questions coming in from uh, Sveta Gupta, which, uh, which is, she says, when you say holistic development, what are the interventions planned? Is there anything beyond skill set? Yeah. So uh, holistic development is, you know, for example, when it's all about your mind, body, intellect, no? So therefore you're giving importance to physical fitness. You're also giving importance to mental well-being, and you're giving importance to you know, um, your intellect or your work related faculties. So uh, while we feel that, you know, it is important for people to focus on work, we also realize the importance of them being physically and mentally at ease and healthy, alert. So therefore we're doing programs just to share with you some human intervention labs, lab-based learning, like, you know, we've also done that. We've had focus on coaching and mentoring. Coaching and mentoring also help because there also you're providing, uh, you know, you're targeting holistic development of the individual in question. Like for example, you might have a great performer who probably is having a sort of a difficulty in dealing with a psychological setback or an issue at home and that is impacting his work. So when you say holistic development, you're focusing on that. Now, again, holistic development in another sense, that blending of both the hard and soft skills. The hard skills are the digital skills and, uh, you know, all that you can measure. The soft skills are the ones which you can't really measure, but which sort of help build the, uh, you know, build the foundation for the hard skills. So that is also holistic. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Dr. Swati. A few more questions coming in. Yeah, sure. Ashima Jain, uh, Dr. Swati, which is, uh, you know, can you share your thoughts on the talent management approach? Is it purely on potential or a mix of performance and potential? Yeah, uh, so talent is a mix of both. When you're talking about identifying talent, I, I just mentioned here also in LNT, we look at uh, talent uh, in terms of what has got delivered and what is likely to be delivered by the uh, talent. Mm. So both performance and potential. And uh, therefore, the potential also becomes more important because performance is more easy to see. You can, you've already seen it's demonstrated. But many times people who are effective in a current role may not be effective in a future role or the next level role. That is a time when you need to make a bet or take a bet on their potential. 
so it is a mix of both for us mm, right great yeah next next no problem yes. yeah uh, so i think just to add there uh, you know the potential can also be because you're talking about digital skills here so the what you are measuring really right can also be some of the competencies that uh, dr swathi and i mentioned earlier in our presentation yeah so, yeah yeah a lot of these competencies in fact when you look at the word competency competency is also a lot about potential you know it's like a tip of the iceberg is what you see but there's a lot underneath you know so you have motives you have values of the person the preferences of the person what is uh, what he's capable of delivering so it's a lot about competency based development great wonderful okay um, i have another question um, again from aman which says how do i thrive how to thrive digital transformation how to drive digital transformation especially if you have a multi generational workforce any thoughts there uh, yeah yeah so you know we also at lnt we have 63% who are millennials now digital transformations when you drive it is not a one person's agenda it's a company wide agenda and obviously but obviously you're going to have uh, people working in teams uh, trying to work towards it so when you work in teams are going to be heterogeneous you're going to have people who are probably in gener across generations now every generation has a, has certain strengths and certain things to offer can you leverage those strengths like for example the older generation might be more stable in terms of uh, having wisdom on how the past has been and giving you insights about that the younger generation the uh, the uh, you know uh, what whom we call uh, the millennials might be more good at multitasking learning things on the fly you know they are like that they're more uh, articulate in what they want so can you bring in the best of uh, talents and then uh, you know can you sort of have uh, align people focus on inclusivity so when you make people sensitive to di diversity and focus on inclusivity you'll be able to drive digital transformations so whenever groups are created or when agendas are driven probably you know you are trying to have a mix of people from various uh, cultures from various age groups from various gender why only generations and then uh, leverage on the strengths of each and take those agendas ahead when we use the word transformation and in digital transformation the word transformation comes you're trying to change something i think the very reason why you want to change something is because you feel that the existing can have a better way the exist whatever is existing can be done better or needs to be done better so for that need to be done better and finding ways you need to get different perspectives so i uh, for what uh, i can tell you from experience uh, creating uh, you know a good mesh of people across generation really helps also trying to uh, get onboarding programs etc done uh, helps trying to have these uh, we speak or you know all you know like talk campaigns conversations around it also helps so rather than structured approaches sometimes semi formal and uh, informal approaches also work reverse mentoring can be useful as an initiative sure sure great wonderful thanks a lot um, again dr swati a uh, couple of more questions uh, that i hear dr swati are uh, this is from shivani uh, uh, and the question is how do you develop a digital mindset and i think a sub question there is how can hr act as a catalyst uh, to do this yeah so uh, mind a digital mindset uh, so the way we define a digital mindset is as follows digital mindset can be seen in three ways one is the ability to be able to think beyond existing business models and therefore be open to exploring new business models or a new ways of doing things doing business second is to make uh, the businesses more aligned to customers so engaging more closely and more empathetically with customers and the third part of digital mindset is trying to make the existing old processes more operationally efficient so that you are uh, focusing on imperatives of speed scale and time these are the three connotations now if i look at digital mindset our endeavor is to improve on these three areas can they be more operationally efficient can they be more customer engaged can they think of new business models by design thinking through these three areas you can develop a digital mindset how do we do it training programs are not the only solution you have to keep sort of creating an environment where they are allowed to innovate take risk and in lnt our tagline is lnt is all about reimagineering so mm -hmm. we actually focus a lot on you know making people imagine 
new ways of uh, doing things by breaking the old uh, or the existing or established uh, patterns in status quo. So it's a lot about doing all this. Great, wonderful. Um, also to add, I think uh, we at Northscape also have developed a unique point of view on how to go about uh, enhancing these three aspects that Dr. Swati just mentioned. Um, you can probably look it up on our website if you want to learn more. It's called Blur uh, and I will um, just leave it at that for now. Um, I think there are a couple of more uh, questions, uh, Dr. Swati, shall we quickly take? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so uh, Kapilish again who asks, what is the one thing that should not change uh, when VUCA is going on? Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> I think uh, the one thing that should not change when VUCA is going on is people's, uh, uh, the core values should not change. Because, you know, you might change the way they align, the way they adapt, the way, um, you know, all that can change. But the core values of the humanness should not change. So, which is the inside, the core of the person. When I say the inside of the core of the person, it talks about, uh, you know, what makes them feel most human. Maybe things like empathy things like uh, being mindful, that should not change. Okay, wonderful. Great. Uh, and I think there's a question from Venkat Ramana also. He has a slightly tangential question, Dr. Swati, which yeah. that, uh, you know, from an educational standpoint, I think because you also have the yeah, yeah. How can yeah. something be uh, you know, included as a part of uh, the educational system is this question. Yeah. So I think uh, it's a very important question because uh, in fact, what corporates do is uh, they build on talent uh, who have already come uh, halfway in their journey, you know, because you're taking talent and as a part of your workforce. But if you see the nurturing of talent really happens in the formative years and when the people, uh, when I mean, I would say kids start going to school and colleges and all their B school, etc. happens. So I, I, I would say that if education is more focused on holistic development, again, building people, making them more digitally aware and digitally adaptive, that would really help. And also, you know, rather than making it more theoretical, they should be more practice based. Because uh, knowing theories is fine. And but today in the age of information and availability, easy access to information is there any which ways all that is available. Can we help kids? Can we teach them how to learn, learning how to learn? You know, because learning how to learn is very important. No, Things are changing so fast that what they learned in school and colleges will become very redundant when they join the workforce. Right. And when they're working on the workforce, also things are changing very rapidly. But if they know the uh, trait or they know the trick of learning how to learn faster, they can really thrive in any competitive world. And no matter how the fast uh, the demands change. So that would be a good thing to focus. And holistic development, work-life balance, you know, the balance is also important. Right. Wonderful. In fact, I think uh, one of the most uh, interesting courses or, uh, you know, courses on Coursera is, is exactly this, which is learning how to learn that people yeah. Uh, yeah, sign up for. And uh, also to add there, I think um, very recently in this book uh, by Yuval Noah Harari, uh, yeah. one skills for 21st century, I think he makes a mention that this entire, uh, you know, skill of uh, sense making, which is the ability to really comprehend data, and to be able to be comfortable with data should be a um, skill that should be taught in schools because you're all yeah, yeah. in the age of information overload. So you need right. to be able to make sense of what's going on around you. In fact, that insight deriving is more important than data itself. Data is available. How are you able to make sense out of it? If that focus can be taught in school, then uh, people would have learned, uh, you know, I mean, kids will learn growing up with that particular skill and they'll do wonders when they become part of the workforce. Yes, yes. Great, super. Um, so I think uh, we are done with all the questions that have come our way, Dr. Swati. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, so any any parting comments, uh, Dr. Swati, before we wind up? I think, yeah. I think uh, Subhu, I'd like to share and take this opportunity to share that I really uh, thank Nolscape for inviting me to be a part of this, uh, you know, webinar. It was very interesting. Uh, you know, virtually, it's what digital has made it what digital has made possible. We could have a webinar, connect with a virtual group uh, of learners and uh, like-minded people who are interested in uh, sharing or learning on this topic. We had a few questions that got us triggered also. And uh, you are there in Bangalore, and I'm here, and we have Nolscape as a platform uh, bringing us together on this and about a topic which I'm very passionate about. So this was really wonderful. And this is what technology and digital has done for us to, you know, be able to manage this and uh, make it uh, so nice as an experience. 
I also try to, I would like to thank my colleague, uh, you know, Vishal Shankar, who's there with me here. Uh, he's a part of my team and um, he has been there with me as we started discussing with Subhu on this. And um, it was, uh, thank you so much, Vishal, for your thank help you. and your uh, insights all through. Great. Yes, in fact, okay. in that, yes. Uh, sorry, is there anything else, Dr. Sir? No, 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 that's it. I thought there's a question coming up. No, no problem. Okay. Please go ahead. Yes, so I think yes, completely agree with you. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's it's fascinating that we are able to do this, um, you know, remotely without ever meeting anyone, and we have uh, you know 35, 40 participants who logged in and who are listening yeah. in. And not just in India, I think there are participants from Asia Pacific also who have logged in and are listening, and it's made possible. I think the connection that we speak about uh, is is being played out here in this webinar itself. So it's fascinating indeed. Uh, and um, thanks a lot for taking the time out to uh, you know uh, to come and share your insights with us uh, in terms of your own experiences, which I'm sure has added a lot of value uh, to the folks who have listened in here. So thanks again, uh, Dr. Swati and Vishal, for taking the time. Thank you, Subhu. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vishal. Have a Bye. good day. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.